All right, looks like we're on. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening or good morning, depending upon where you are. My name is Bill Gustin, captain with Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department. And uh, we're here for our uh, Wednesday installment of the Hangout, uh, along with Bobby Halton and Clark Lamping, Daryl Liggins, Captain Mike Dugan, and the man behind the curtain is uh, Peter Prokeo. So uh, we're, our topic is going to be booster lines, but before we get into that, uh, let's give a shout out to our brothers in, uh, in Philadelphia and in New York City that uh, had been put to the test, both in their firefighting skills, in their mental and physical toughness, and in their medical skills. And make no mistake about it, uh, a lot of those companies that were responding in on those those extra alarm fires were there for EMS. So it's very much uh, a firefighter's job. So uh, beforehand, just so everybody understands this viewing, uh, we discussed amongst ourselves to what extent we would discuss the, uh, the fire that occurred in the Bronx on, uh, on Sunday. And uh, we do not want to speculate. Uh, I asked Captain Mike, uh, would he be comfortable talking about uh, the building? Because he's familiar with that type of building. And uh, he very wisely said he doesn't think at this point, with an investigation ongoing, without all the facts being there, that it's better for us just to leave it at what we know. What do we know? We know that our brothers on the FDNY did an incredible job. And, and similarly, our brothers in Philadelphia did a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, and the other thing I can say uh, about the fire in, in New York City, don't, if you're sitting in middle America right now, don't dismiss this fire as being, oh, that's a New York City thing. No way. That fire could happen in your community today. It does not have to be a high rise building. It, that, it could be a completely fireproof building, but there were just certain defects that uh, contributed to this that we will discuss at another time. There'll be plenty written about it, but don't dismiss this as being uh, a New York City thing. It could happen anywhere in middle America. Um, not present today is Jason Hovelman. Uh, he's the chief of Florissant Valley Fire Protection District. Jason has been stricken with the, the crud. He's got the plague and he's on the mend, but uh, God bless you, Jason. Uh, our uh, Dan Shaw is not with us. He's probably at another promotional ceremony getting another uh, bugle on his badge. Uh, every time I talk, the guy's getting promoted. And, um, and then uh, our friend uh, Samuel Hiddle is probably inventing something in his basement right now that um, he, he, can't be, um, he can't be bothered with participating today. Sam, wherever you are, man. Uh, hey, we want you to uh, write an article, Sam. We want you to write an article on um, lithium ion battery powered tools. Uh, I've scratched the surface, but I wanna go into the uh, chemical and electrical aspects of uh, how they work, what their limitations are. Uh, boss, you know, I wrote, wrote, wrote an article on that. It's entitled, um, I, I, by the way, am I plugging myself? Yeah, yeah, of course I am. Uh, training props put uh, battery powered tools to the test. So um, I want to thank our good friends at Key Hose. That's keyhose.com. Uh, I could look out the window right now at the training grounds here where it's, uh, it's a frigid uh, about 74 degrees outside right now. And um, the guys are slipping and sliding around on the ice as they're pulling the, the hose uh, up into the training tower, but they're putting this hose to the test. You want to put any kind of equipment to the test, give it to your recruit training program and uh, you'll, um, uh, you'll have, uh, you'll put it to the test. Uh, so we put it to the test. Our topic today is booster lines. And uh, I want to know how come and when I be entered the fire service in 1973, up until this, the almost the mid seven, uh, 
uh, into the early 80s, the most commonly used hose line that we would take in on a structure fire was a booster line. And we were successful. Now, were we lucky? Were we stupid? Were we lazy? Uh, what was it that made us successful? And if we were successful then, why is it not a good idea today? So I, I, I'm going to ask Bobby Halton. He's, uh, he's got seniority over me, so he gets to go first. You're muted. I've, I've got seniority over you and Dugan by a couple of months. Yeah. <clears throat> That's about it. Um, and I think it's a fascinating evolution just in our, uh, our, our industry. We, we used to have the booster reels. We used them for, you know, trash bin fires. We used them on, you know, small little grass fires. And, and I still think that they have a place in the American Fire Service. I think they're not completely without uh, utility. And, and now when you're specking a booster reel for a, a piece of apparatus, you could actually get varying degrees of width of hose. You can also do multiple nozzle configurations on them. You know, they're not all the hard nitrile, uh, uh, small diameter uh, reels that, that we had back when, when uh, you and I were, 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 on the, uh, were on the tailboard. I apologize for that. Um, I'll have to call this guy back. Um, Anyway, um, a couple of things. You know, they had they had some utility that, that obviously was always relegated to uh, minor events, right? Very very few very few agencies that I knew of, even back in the '80s and '70s, were taking booster reels into working structure fires. Um, you may have the occasional uh, booster reel being used on a mattress that was pulled outside to to put it out. And then the booster reel kind of got replaced, at least where I was working, with the bumper load. The front bumper load became that utility line that was being pulled for the dumpster fires and, and things of that nature. And it was generally an inch and three quarter, you know, maybe 100 foot, 150 foot. <clears throat> and it was just that, you know, it was that nuisance line. Basically, you know, you get those nuisance fires, alley fires, or it's little small trash fires, and, and, and they were used extensively then. And, and so that's kind of been the evolution that, that's happened that I've seen and where the booster line really became vilified uh, in a big way in, in our industry was when it was mistakenly thought that the uh, good people in Charleston, South Carolina had pulled it as an initial line. Nothing could be further from the truth. But what happened with that booster line that we know from interviews directly with the firefighters who were there was that there was a young man, it was, it was in fact his first fire and he was riding on uh, one of the later due engine companies. Anyway, his officer called for another line. He said, you know, go get a line. Well, that kid wasn't going back in there without something in his hands. He went in briefly with the booster line. He, he abandoned it rather quickly and exited the building. But the photos showed it very plainly. And many people, I, <clears throat> I think, in a, a what used to be called a pecking party, if chickens see a speck of blood under the chicken, they'll start pecking at it and pecking at it. So there was a there was a pecking party where a lot of people vilified the good firefighters of South Carolina, uh, for uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, for that fire. Whereas there were some of the most competent firefighters on the face of the planet who got caught in a set of really incredibly dynamic and wickedly complex circumstances. But those those men and women in that department <clears throat> were elegant firefighters. They were well trained. They were good people. Uh, did they have shortcomings? Absolutely. We all did. But never for the grace of God goes me or any other fire ground commander. Um, a tremendously important fire to understand, tremendously important fire to put yourself into and try to understand why they made the decisions that they did. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to gentlemen like Chris Villarreal and others who were there, you quickly realize that these were highly trained, highly competent, highly skilled, highly motivated men and women. And so that booster line in the front that many people jumped on is, well, look at these guys, they're using booster reels, that, that nothing could have been further from the truth. And if you look at Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most beautiful cities in America, their property loss at that point was some of the lowest in America because those men and women could deploy their hand lines so with such rapidity and such efficiency that even with those zero lot lines on those antique wooden structures that they protect every day, they were generally able to confine the fire to its point of origin in, in the vast majority of cases. So 
Did they upgrade their incident command system? Did they do a ton of great training? Did many wonderful people go in there and, and do a tremendous amount of work, including, you know, um, I'm blanking on him. He's now at the National Fire Academy. Great guy. Uh, John, uh, what, what's John's name, Mike? You know who I'm talking about, Billy. He's a, an instructor. And he's, he's working with the NFFF now, doing programs for the NFFF. Tibbets, Tibbets, wonderful guy. And, and, and um, uh, uh, our, our friend, um, uh, the chief who passed away, Tommy Carr, they did fantastic work. So anyway, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, there, there are, have been places, a friend of mine, Greg Redmond from, uh, uh, Greg's chimed in on Facebook here saying that according to him, he works out of the St. Louis area, that, that the booster line did go into some, some fires. Uh, I was around in the 80s. It, it, it did, Greg, sometimes, to, to be honest with you, when it was like a trash can or something like that, something minor. Um, when, when the troops knew it wasn't much, but if, if they had a good work and fire, we used, to, we used to pull it. St. Louis guy. Yeah. Greg's a St. Louis guy. Good guy. And, uh, and thanks for that comment there from Facebook. So, and we do get your comments pulled in. So if you have a good comment, um, it, I, I wouldn't say it was a go-to line or any place I work, Greg, it, it may have been in some of the, some of the houses, uh, where you were at, but I, I never saw it as a go-to line and, and at least not in my experience. So but I'll send it, to, send it off to the next guy. How about you, Clark? Do you have booster uh, lines on your apparatus in the Las yes. Vegas area? Yeah, we do, Cap. We have uh, booster lines. Um, we have the, the small hard rubber hose, um, high pressure, <clears throat> high pressure hose. We, myself personally, um, we don't use a lot of it, right? And I personally believe that for the amount of costs and the amount of ways and the amount of space it takes up on the apparatus, I think we can do better than that booster reel. I mean, we, we never, we have a policy that never goes interior. So it's simply dumpster fires and grass fires. I think it's a lot of equipment, a lot of expensive equipment for a dumpster fire and a grass fire. <clears throat> um, when we have, we have uh, bumper lines as well. So we typically pull the bumper line out, inch and three quarter bumper line rubber jacketed. And that works always a lot better. Yeah, it's a little harder to load, to unload and load. Um, but uh, and, you know, we had a, we had an incident. We were always blowing the fuses on the auto reel. And it turned out if you put any resistance as you're trying to reel that up with the automatic reel, if you put any resistance on that, you were popping the fuse. And the mechanics had to come out and show because every every apparatus was popping their fuse. So they had to come out and show us how to reset that. So that was a problem we experienced. Well, of course, Clark, because you take a rag and you put it around the booster reel. And you guide it on there. That's how you clean it. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Clark, both, this is for both uh, Daryl and you. Um, we've started to purchase some one-inch forestry hose because we have some rigs that just don't have the room for the uh, booster reel. And uh, Quinn apparatus. Uh, do you think, what is your experience, uh, Clark and, and uh, Daryl, with for one inch forestry hose. And is it a, a suitable uh, substitute for the, for a three quarter or one inch booster reel? Okay. Uh, I, have no, I have no experience with one inch forestry hose. We do not have any, any one inch hose on our apparatus. Yeah, we, we do have one inch forestry hose. I don't think it's a suitable replacement because um, as you know, we, we are in a wild, area we use a lot of wildland hose and it it's not durable it's just like a disposable type hose and um it's used primarily just for mop up not even during a grass fire but just mopping up hot spots uh tree stumps and things of that nature after a, a wildland fire but also just the types of areas that we're generally using because we still do have a real line a booster line we call it a red line everybody's got a different nickname um it, it's very difficult to clean too because of the the material where the, yeah, the yeah. booster line we can just wipe wipe down as we're as we're loading it back out um we we did have a history of using this red line prior to me coming into the organization for for fire attack and um, a lot of it, from my understanding, came just from 
it, it was probably not as volatile type of fuels in a lot of East Oakland bungalow houses. And I'm sure they were very successful with it. I, I didn't experience that because it was uh, previous to my time. But during those times, remember, structure hose was also cotton and it caused a lot of work when you re return to the firehouse to hang this hose back up and change it out. And so um, uh, I had a captain that was a, a chief's aide and he said that he believed a lot of it was kind of done out of, out of laziness to avoid not having to take care of that hanging the hose. So he had a battalion chief that went to a fire that a company put out with a real line and he told them to, after the fire's over, after they've overhauled, go down the street, bring in a lead, we call a supply and a lead, uh, pull a line and charge it all and stay there till they did it all because I guess he was sending out a message that you're not gonna take shortcuts and get out of work. However, um, when I did come in, I was still working on apparatus that had the booster lines removed. So they had a period of time where they said, hey, no more, that was the solution to not have people bring those into structures. But that time ended and we currently do have booster lines on our on all of our apparatus. But I, I concur with Clark, it, it's very expensive and I don't know, uh, I think there are better alternatives, but um, that, that's still what we currently have. You know, just as a historical, well, before that, let, let me ask uh, Captain Mike, um, the FDNY, is there anything in writing etched in stone about when a booster can be used and cannot be used? Booster can't be used for a structural fire, okay? Um, most of the times, we don't even use booster lines. We use the trash line. Um, we did have booster reels. They were for rubbish fires, things like that. Uh, but I do have to uh, contradict uh, Chief Walton a little bit, because when I started in the volunteers in 1974, we were using high pressure fog as fire attack because we were more worried about water damage than we were about uh, fire. And we would leave all the windows intact and go in with the bean gun, uh, which was really a farm apparatus and high pressure fog. And we would uh, fog the fire out inside with the pea shooter and 17 gallons of water a minute. And it had a spray nozzle so it could spray in your face to keep you cool. That's how old they were. And we all ended up getting burnts around the wrist and everything else because of it. Uh, and we finally realized that we were damaging firefighters and not worrying about firefighters, worrying about the property of people whose house caught on fire. And uh, we were burning firefighters. So um, we went away from that. Um, but that was where I started in a volunteer. When I was in the city, I never saw a booster line go into a structure fire. I did see one used one time very, very um, smartly by a truck chauffeur um, to when uh, someone was on a fire escape and there was a fire in a window off the fire escape but coming up towards them. And he used it to protect the people on the fire escape. And I thought that was a very, very smart move because the engine chauffeur was pumping the hand lines inside and everything else. And I think there's a place for everything. But I agree with Clark and Daryl. You can use a trash line. You know, you can still use the same thing and do the same thing. So um, the engine the three quarter hose in on the front bumper with either 50 or 100 feet of hose is uh, works the same way. And again, it's easier. It's not time consuming to roll it up and then you get it rolled up and you get it jammed in there and everything else. And you can control the amount of water you put on it. It's not like that bean gun. And again, that was high pressure fog. It was 17 gallons of water a minute. But Captain Mike, only you and I, and maybe four other people that are watching this, know what the heck a bean gun is. And remember, it looked like a, a ray gun. Yeah. It looked like a machine. And you could feel the pulsation because it was a positive pressure pump. And you are spot on. It came, I think it was designed originally to uh, 
uh, put pesticides in, in orchards or something? In or FWD, yes. Farm Works Division. FWD designed it, Farm Works Division. Exactly right. And uh, in Chicago, uh, because the mainstay of their, their rigs did not have booster tanks or lines until uh, uh, well into the 70s, uh, their answer was small four-wheel drive apparatus on international and... Um, uh jeep uh international overhead. harvester and jeeps yep. right and and they now they they would use the john beam which was positive pressure a uh, positive displacement and then ws darley had a four stage but they still i think they got up to about 800 psi now the air force is using a variant of that now captain mike but it's still mike it sounds good <laughs> And it looks good on paper and under the proper conditions of confinement, a lot of heat, and you're not expecting to save anybody. It, it, it does work, but you're, otherwise it defies the laws of physics. But uh, that is what, uh, so that, that's what a beam gun is for listen, the rest of you guys. You hey, Daryl, Daryl, you know what, I... what the hell are all these old people talking about, Daryl? I have no idea what's even going on right now. This is, uh, it is, I am not one that had heard of this bean gun. Now, is this a, a nickname or is it, was that the actual John name of the bean? Bean was the bean. name of the manufacturer, John Bean. And it was a silver nozzle that had a, you could go to fog, you could rotate it. It had a, a neural uh, knob. You could rotate it to go to fog or straight stream. And it was really for, like he said, for shooting um, pesticides into apple orchards. But an indirect method of attack was how it was used in the fire service. And again, we used to say uh, when we first did it, nobody would take any windows. Nobody would break any windows. Nobody would vent the structure. And you would go in with it, create steam because it was high pressure fog, create steam. The steam would put out the, uh, the active flame it would still be hot as hell and you would still get burnt, but you would put out the active flame. So the and plan was to do a true compartmental, compartmentalized attack as AKA Lloyd L Lehman, mm -hmm. uh, Na Navy shipboard firefight. Co correct, that's where it came from. Right. And it was adapted from that. And like I said, when I started in the volunteers, we had the bean guns and they went into every structure fire. Except, so, except commercial. They didn't go into any commercials. So remember, Bill, back in the, the older booster reels, 70s, circa 70s and 80s, they had Navy fog nozzles on them. Many of them had real Navy fog nozzles with the little spigot. And, you know, yeah, and it went from half to fog, full. And then you had the, um, you could take the fog tip off, mm -hmm. put the pineapple in. Yeah, the piercing the applicator. Nozzle. Yeah, the applicator or the piercing nozzle. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we've got a couple of interesting comments come into from uh, from the Facebook page. So as the uh, resident ombudsman, I'll uh, bring them out. And, and this comes from Derek Day, and he said we used to have a big candy cane in the tip and put it on top of the oil wells when they got struck by lightning. Now I've never done any uh, any wild any uh, oil rig firefighting. I do know the guys at uh, um, Williams Fire and Hazard Control, so I'd have to ask them about what that's about. But he says, it's make, believe it or not, it's making a slow comeback. So I wonder what the candy cane is. You know, it's probably the name of a... Go ahead, Mike. You're, you're muted, Mikey. It's the applicator, Bobby. The candy the cane. Applicator. The okay. applicator that, that came off the nozzle, the applicator, and yep. it's like a pineapple shape, and it put, it'll put the foam out in all around so it's aspirating the foam out of the tip it's a, like a like a an aspirator and then joe joe weiss i hope i got that right joe he said we added a, a booster reel to their 3,000 gallon tender uh, mainly for wildland tender also has three inch your know, three quarter inch cross lays for the big deals structure fires or vehicle fires mm -hmm. our smaller tender has booster reels for wildland because the wildland fires on the mountain i think they work well for rural departments at, with multiple wildland incidents. So I think that the point is, you know, when we talk with Clark, just real briefly as we talk about this topic too, and please throw your comments on, we'd love to hear more about your experience. <clears throat> because remember, Clark is in downtown Las Vegas. Now, 
all the grass there is in people's pockets and plastic bags for later recreational use. So not a lot, not a lot of wild, the wildland grass fires that he has are in hotel rooms. So we actually, actually boss, we do have grass fires, but it's all plastic grass. It's all fake. The palm trees are plastic. The grass is plastic. The hotels are plastic. The lawn furniture is plastic. The cabanas are, everything's plastic. And you want to see a good fire, try a plastic grass fire. That would kick of, your butt. It reminds me of a girl I dated in, in Vegas, but that's another story for another time. Another story entirely. So, I know her. I know. You want me to tell you, you said hi? Yeah, you can. I appreciate that. But I think, you know, I, th I think that, you know, it's the baby in the bathwater, right? There are places where people have really useful applications for it. And I'm sure guys that are doing like rural uh, firefighting, maybe farmland, you know, a lot of farmland activity and stuff may have some interesting things to share with us about it. I never heard about the fuse being blown, Clark, and, and we had them on. Most of the rigs that I came on had them. Um, I, not, not as more any, you don't see it being spec as more because you see most people going with the bumper, with the bumper load, you know? So, um, so I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's, it's going away completely, but when I look at the rigs, with, when I look at the rigs coming in, um, you know, I, I don't see as many rigs getting booster reels put on them anymore. So, and from Greg Redmond, Greg again, uh, asks, is it the same as an IFEX gun, I-F-E-X gun, booster? So, and uh, someone else has just chimed in that the booster reel is still being used where they are for vehicle fires, which is interesting to me. We, you know, we what's are, interesting for me is I, I worked at this company on, on the East end and Engine 27, we were known for getting like the most vehicle fires. That was what we went to all the time, vehicle after vehicle fire. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes three a day. Um, so I've, I've had my share of vehicle fires, as I'm sure a lot of people listening to. And we used a regular inch and three quarter line, a majority of the time on my shift. Now, most of the city, if you saw a vehicle fire, most of the city is probably using a red line. And a couple things that when people ask me, you know, why are you using a regular line? That wasn't a first due company. We rarely ever went to any first due uh, structure fire on that company. And I said, if this is just an opportunity for them to stretch a regular line, flake it out, mask up. It's like an emperor, you know, uh, they're not doing this on a regular basis at, at house fire. So we're just getting used to operating a regular line. But the other thing is, I think the mindset uh, uh, is something that troubles me a bit of believing that these fires are always going to be um, easy. And I'll have to steal something from uh, Dave McGrail, a good friend of mine who said he, he likes his firefighters to stay in a high gear mindset. So one of my guys, he promoted a lieutenant. They went to a vehicle fire on the freeway, he calls me. He's like, hey, the guys are asking why I use a regular line. And, you know, he didn't really have a, a good answer. So he's, he wants to know my thought process. I said, I don't mind if they use a booster line on, on certain fire find if they just go in there believing it's going to be easy and that it's harder to go from this gonna be easy to shift to a high gear mindset i want you to go to a door as if it's going to be tough search as if somebody's going to be in this in this room and go to a vehicle that it, it might be a box truck full full of tires or, or something i or an electric vehicle that needs a lot more water but um, if we go into things thinking it's going to be easy and it's harder than we think, it's going to be harder to kind of shift up in that, in that situation. We were going to one vehicle fire and the, the new firefighter in the back said, Hey boss, you want the bumper line or the booster line? I, said, I, don't, I don't know. We're not there yet. Let's see what we, we have when we get there. And it so happened on that one, it was up this long driveway in a carport. And we needed a, like a 250 foot line. The booster line is 200 feet long and we need a long stretch. So I didn't want people just set in this mindset that if it's a car, we're gonna use a, a, a booster line. Hey, uh, we're just about at the half, halfway point. Um, 
I honestly don't know if Key makes uh, uh, booster lines, but uh, they do make a ex extremely durable hose. And in tests, uh, they're, they uh, rank with some of the highest, if not the highest for uh, uh, heat and abrasion uh, resistance. Uh, but keep in mind that any hose uh, is not fire hose is not fireproof. Uh, it, it, it definitely isn't. Um, I got a, a kind of an interesting story here. Uh, you know the old story, Daryl, where you know you got a, a twenty pound maul and I'm holding the stake and I say, "Okay, you ready, Daryl? Okay, when I nod my head, hit it." So we get a, uh, a single company response for a car fire. Well, a car was stolen and smashed into a, a wood frame house and you could hear the fire already roaring through the attic and the entire balloon frame wall fell out. And remember, it's when a wall collapses, it's not just the, the, the getting hit by the wall, it's the radiant heat that comes out. So the side of the apparatus is smoking. We were there by ourselves. Uh, we did not lay in. We typically didn't for car fires. And now we're stepping. We're, 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 we're hustling. So as I'm helping the guys drag a five-inch hose back to a hydrant that we should have laid into to begin with, I tell this new guy, I grab the booster from the side booster reel on the top. And I said, Knowles, use the booster because the side of the apparatus was steaming. Knowles, use the booster. So I come back from hooking up to the hydrant and here's Knowles standing in front of this raging inferno. I don't know how he kept from getting burnt, vaporizing the booster line on the fire itself. He never did put it on the apparatus, but hey, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, explicit enough. Now, how about this for a concept? I had a great discussion with a friend of mine, Ray Bell, uh, Rocket Ray Bell, no pay Ray. And he was explaining that there is a, uh, a, a fire department that does a lot of work in the middle part of America that equips their ladder apparatus with a booster line and about a 200 gallon tank. And while the engines are backing down and leading out, revert, laying in or laying out, the truck in lieu of a two and a half inch gallon can or a five gallon hand pump is stretching a booster. Now it is not being stretched in lieu of a larger diameter line. It is stretched in, in advance and anticipation of another line. And it's doing basically the same thing that the two and a half gallon water extinguisher would do in terms of uh, getting in a position where you could close a door uh, and that type of thing. And, and, uh, the way Ray explained it, you know, some people are critical of that. Well, the people that are critical of taking a booster in there uh, don't seem to have a problem with taking a two and a half gallon water can in. So what about that for a concept? Uh, it is <laughs> a 200 gallon. Pardon me? I disagree for one okay. reason. Okay, go ahead. Look at the, um, the Bronx fire and look at the picture. And we're not going to get into depth, but the chauffeurs. Made all the grabs. If the chauffeur's pumping, how's he positioning the ladder? How is he taking care of the uh, thing? He can't do both. Okay. Your can man, one guy with the officer, can bring in two and a half gallons of water. Okay. But uh, if you have to pump the, the rig now and um, stretching that hose line in, where are you going to get the people to go around if you got to go up to the second or third floor? Okay. I mean, again, you're not bringing tools then? If you're a truck company, that's a thing. And I just have one other point, and I want to make sure we cover this because somebody sent me an email. We're talking about booster reels, booster lines here, not booster water. And that's a huge difference. Using the booster tank for quick fire attack is a whole mother class, a whole mother uh, hump day hangout that we can do another time. Booster attacks, quick knockdown with water that you brought with you is different than using a booster reel. And we cannot get those confused because somebody sent me an email about they thought we were talking about using booster water for quick knockdown, because that's one of the new things that's coming a lot. I'm hearing about in outside the in fires where it starts out in the mulch pile 
around the house on the outside and burns in. And we had the one in um, up in uh, New York where uh, the police lieutenant and four of his family members died in the house and his son was outside having a cigarette beforehand, threw it in the uh, mulch bed and went back in the house, was still awake and he got out. He was the only one who got out. So again, quick water is different than using the booster line. So I just want to make sure we reiterate that. Sorry, go ahead. No, you make you bring up a, a very good point. You bring so up I think, a very good point. And I remember uh, the old professor, John Middendorf says, if you want to have a quint, fine, but put 10 guys on it. <laughs> you hear me? Put 10 guys on it. Why? Because you need five guys to be the truck company and you need five guys to be the engine company if you're going to be both. Very, it could just kind of interesting food for thought. So I can see that the gears are turning in the boss's head there. Yeah, a couple of things. So also, you know, if someone's taking in a red line or booster line, not, not, not off tank water, not a line off tank water, but an actual booster line in, you know, obviously you got a 200 foot limitation to begin with <clears throat> and you're advancing a line versus a firefighter with a can has a great deal of range and mobility. They can, they can move incredibly fast. And the whole idea of the can is to affect cool down in, in specific areas or, or extinguishment in specific areas that you can. And so that the can, can operations, which is a whole nother, I mean, we could spend a, we could spend two or three shows on can operations because it's really an incredible art. And the, and the men and women who are good at it are unbelievable in the amount of fire that they can extinguish with a can. Uh, and, and I've seen it done um, and I'm not that good. So uh, my hat's off to the men and women who get really proficient with it because I just never spent a lot of time with a can on my back. I never got the experience I needed to become good at it. But Paul Blake, at the, one other point, and I'm going to tie it into Paul Blake's comment. And thank you, Paul. This is a great comment. He said, booster reels take up a lot of compartment space and he would prefer a one inch that has, you know, ha that has less. And, and that's a great comment. I, I totally get it. Uh, uh, George uh, Darabi called in and he said, we called it a, a high, low velocity nozzle in the Navy. And he used to use them in both a three and, and a three and both in a three man attack team. So a, a great piece of uh, Navy history there from George. And thank you. And a great point by Paul. And thank you. And, and one of the things I want to throw out, having worked for the U.S. Forest Service and used a lot of forestry line, because obviously that's what we had back in the day in the 70s, it, it, it actually wept. In other words, that line uh, self-saturates. And, and the reason for that was ground cover fires, obviously smoldering, a lot of heat and such. And you would be pulling the lines across embers and debris that was still you know, putting out a great deal of heat. And the theory was that the, the weeping lines would provide some level of protection for the hand line. So my question to you, Bill, when, and Key does produce one inch hose, uh, by the way, that also came in from Paul. Uh, thank you for that. So the, is the forestry line that you're purchasing in, in Florida currently, does it weep, Bill? Is it line that's going to weep? Is it, is, it, is it true forestry line? I don't think it does, but Paul Blake would know a heck of a lot better. Paul Blake happens to be uh, one of arguably our most uh, uh, informed and self-educated uh, fire officers on wildland firefighting because we do have, we don't have the terrain, but, and we don't have it all year round, but we have nasty fires that threaten entire neighborhoods, primarily in the south end of the county where there is no water. And Paul educated himself uh, it, it, to the point where he got himself, I think there's a green card or something, uh, not to be confused with what everybody's trying to get coming into the country, some type of blue card or green card. Oh, the red card. Uh, it's a wildland red card. Yeah, yeah. And Paul educated, took the time to educate himself and then uh, was the driving force behind us uh, getting into rural water supply. And what I mean by rural is without hydrants because we do have we go from vast vast wild land to 60 story high rises uh, all in the same jurisdiction but uh, so paul would be better uh qualified to answer that question if there's a rubber liner in that or a synthetic rubber liner or a through the weave or does it weep but i don't think it weeps so uh, guys 
I asked a rhetorical question at the beginning of the, um, the, our session. We were successful with the booster lines. Were we lucky? Were we stupid? Were we lazy? Well, the answer is the contents of the homes or the dwellings that we were operating in was markedly different than it is today. And Captain Mike, you and I have talked about this, that when we were talking about protect in place, we don't have time to escape. We don't have time because of the amount of, uh, and again, it's, it's not just as we, as we're students of the fire service, we understand it is not just the BTU per pound, it's the heat release rate. You wanna measure it in megawatts or joules or whatever you wanna do, whatever it is, it takes more water than it used to. Now, I get the underwriters laboratory studies that say they did 35 tests and in all but one used 275 gallons of water. Uh, okay, I get that yeah, under, under those conditions, but um, don't go to a, your next fire thinking you're gonna put it out with uh, 275 gallons of water. Uh, but the answer is why we're not using the booster lines is that we are dealing with an entirely different animal today because of heat release rate in petrochemical based material. And we were also having a discussion before uh, we got on online here about, uh, well, how we, I used to pride myself on how much smoke I could take. And back in the set, and it was a measure of how, what a tough fireman you are. But I wasn't inhaling hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, the way that we are today. You try to take a whiff of smoke today, it's like somebody threw some acid in your face because essentially that's what it is. In your eyes, in your nose, in your mouth, man, those days are over. And uh, we... We have to be able to ad adapt and understand and continue to be students of the fire service. So what we did 20, 30 years ago is not the right thing to do necessarily today. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Just tagging along with what you said, um, I was listening on the scanner to that job in the Bronx on Sunday. And I was listening to it as it was going on. And I heard a call go out over the citywide radio for any ambulance in the city of New York that had a Sino kit on board to head to the Bronx, okay? That's how much they needed of the uh, cyanide for the smoke, for the smoke. Now, um, I had never heard that before, never, ever. And uh, just very interesting that uh, the smoke in that building, you could see the differences uh, of the smoke coming out, those things, with what's in the contents of the smoke. It's the, the um, material that's burning. Back when, what we were, when we started, I remember them telling me when I started that the ceiling temperature could get up to five to 600 degrees. And now, now that's like, that's nothing. That's nothing. I mean, we didn't wear hoods. We had three quarter boots. Um, you know, we had boots and the rubber coats, okay, and your ears told you when it was getting hot, okay. But again, it's a whole different ball game. You can't eat this smoke. Look at your department. What is the cancer rate among firefighters in uh, Miami Dade? Okay, what's the cancer rate of guys dying of cancer and everything else? And uh, again, you don't want, you know, you want to live long when you retire. And uh, we want to just be aware that the smoke is a carcinogen. What's in there? It's horrible stuff. So just a real quick to dovetail, just to explain to the folks that <clears throat> may not know what a Synod kit is. Basically, it's a drug called hydroxycobalamin. It's been around since the 1980s. Um, it's in widespread use all across Europe. In Europe, anybody who comes in as a, a fire victim, anybody gets hydroxycobalamin. There's literally no contraindications for it. If you took too much of it, you'd look like you had a good tan. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, 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 it'll redden your skin a tad bit. 
<clears throat> it comes in a kit for the American Fire Service called Synod Kits. It should be on every engine company, every ladder company, every ambulance company, every rescue company squad in America, because every firefighter who gets it, there's virtually no contraindications. They should get it. What it does is it, it's, a, it's, the, it's the antidote to hydrogen cyanide, um, which is, you know, the problem with hydrogen cyanide, the half-life is incredibly short. And so people, you get to the, by the time people get to a hospital, you know, the half-life of it is so short, it doesn't show up in their bloodstream. But when we've done blood studies of <clears throat> firefighters on scene, their elevated levels of hydrogen cyanide are incredible. Uh, the Providence of, uh, incident, which is well known throughout the country, uh, Kurt Barone's guys, they were 75 feet from the building, but slightly lower than the fire. And the pump operator got overcome by hydrogen cyanide. So when we're talking about, you know, today we're here talking about booster reels and, and engine company operations. And as the booster reel kind of outlived its, uh, it, its, uh, its time, <clears throat> I'm not sure, Bill, to get back to the, to the main topic, I'm not sure, you know, and I think Paul is a genius. I think that, you know, we've got a lot of great folks on this call. I think there's still applications for the booster reel. Uh, you know, maybe the booster reel, maybe a booster reel with a, I just see, you know, and maybe I'm just a hopeless romantic, you know, I, I, I uh, and I, I fully confess to it. I, I love history and I, I find it to be such a, a uniquely, uniquely um, uh, almost idiosync idiosyncratic kind of, uh, uh, element of, of, a, of an older pumper. There it was on the top of the back of the bed, you know, for all the world to see the glorious booster reel, you know, with the giant, you know, line. And it was just, it was just there, right? I mean, and I don't know if it's just waxing poetic for the old days and the, and the, where the rigs had more uh, dimension to them. And, and, and I still, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. And, I, and, and full disclosure, I haven't worked with the booster reel in probably 20 years, maybe longer. Um, just because all the places I've gone have, have basically eliminated them. They just, nobody specs them anymore. And, and to Paul's point, they're expensive. They require maintenance. Um, and, and if you've got a, a bumper load, you know, the bumper load can pick up almost 90% of what the booster reel used to pick up, right? So, and the bumper load, if you have to, you know, flow water, it's still an inch and three quarter line. You can, you can flow real water out of it if you need to. So, um, and, 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 and I, but I love the discussion, right? And I promised our producer, our producer shot me a note and he said, I want a show on the can. So Mike, there you go. We're gonna have to schedule a show on the use of the can. So you're gonna find us a couple of good can aficionados to uh, come on and talk about that, which I, which I don't think will be hard to find. Um, but I, 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 still think, I still think there's some, you know, uh, and here's a, a, a thing in um, from Greg again. He said, regarding success with the booster, it's also a matter of who is defining success, right? Whether we remember our successes more than our failures. And, and that's a great point. And, and, and to Greg's uh, comment there, there's a lot of uh, psychology behind that. Like if you think back to someplace you used to live, you always remember the good things about it, but the reasons that made you move out, you forget, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, Greg's exactly right. And you know, so remembering successes versus remembering failures, um, and it could also be that good firefighters uh, didn't pull a line with limited flow capacity, limited reach w when it wasn't necessary. So the only time they did pull it, it was successful because they pulled it in, in circumstances that literally fit the application. And that's really true with all of our hand lines, right? I mean, whether you're talking about the inch three quarter, the two inch, the two and a half, or even that some folks are still using three inch lines, um, you know, it, you've got to pull the, the correct tool at the time and you got to know how to use it, right? You've got to have the right tip on it because it's a much like an assembly of a, of a wall unit or a building. You, the way we put our rigs together are assemblies, right? So you've got the outlet that, that it's connected to. You've got the line, you've got the length of the line, you've got the pump pressure, you've got the tip, whether it's a smooth bore, a combination, an air aspirating, a fog, it doesn't matter. You've got to know how that tool applies to that particular fire. Like if you're going into a, a, a gas fed fire inside a, a, a manufacturing plant where say two of the lines had broken and you had a gas fed fire, you're not bringing your smooth boards. It's, it's an inappropriate tip at that point. So, but a good firefighter through study and, 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 and patience and learning knows that. So, you know, to Greg's point, uh, that we may have more successes with the booster because we used it in so, at least in my experiences, in such limited fashion. Um, I really can't remember 
and, and there's a lot of things I can't remember at my age, but I really can't remember seeing booster reels inside, except if somebody said it was a food on the stove, you know, somebody might have pulled the booster reel or, or a, a, a waste basket fire. Somebody might have pulled the booster reel. But then it was for, for, for established knowledge that the fire was very limited, very contained. You know what I mean? You know, I, 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 no place I was and, and had people, you know, dragging them into working structure fires. So, so maybe it's just that their successes were limited to the application. But I think it's a great topic. And, and, and I, for one, still, you know, I don't know, if I was specking a rig. <laughs> a couple of things I, was, I wanted to, to add to that is, uh, well, one, going back to the um, cyanide poisoning, all, all of our apparatus, because we're paramedic engine companies, do have a, a kit. We don't, we don't call it a cyanide kit, but we um, have a different drug than what you had mentioned. It's called uh, sodium theosulfate. Oh, and all okay. the ambulances and all the, the engine companies have that. It, it's come and gone, but it, it's currently in. But one topic that we didn't really talk about that is commonly mentioned to me why some people like that booster reel, especially like on vehicles and trash and homeless encampments, which it's used at a lot now, um, is this belief that you're, you're saving water. And um, I... I just have to disagree and uh, back to Bill's comment about these studies of how much total water were, were used in these UL studies. Well, there have been studies also in uh, the higher the flow rate, the less total water you're using. So the firefighter doesn't have to use more gallons just because they have a higher flow rate available to them. They're still in control of when they open and close the bottle, the, that, that nozzle, you can fill up a one gallon can if you want with a two and a half inch line. Doesn't mean you have to flood the, the place. But having that um, lower flow rate can equal a greater amount of water. So when you're often using a booster reel, a lot of times we don't, we don't have a, a water supply because we're out on the freeway on a car or some dead end street or something like that. And so I just, I don't think that should be the, the decision maker. I've told those firefighters like, well, let, let me worry about that. If we're gonna be running out of water or not, I just need to make sure that we get this thing suppressed. And a lot of times if you are running out of water at a car or something, it certainly wasn't, isn't the fire that it was when you got there. <laughs> we, can, we can go ahead and, uh, Fill up the tank again or something. Excellent Darryl, just, just, point. A, just, a, just a quick line on Daryl's point. An old fire captain once told me, Bill, and you'll like this. We were somewhere and I said, you know, because we were on tank water and, and I was kind of doing, he goes, son, if 500 gallons fast doesn't put it out, 500 slow ain't the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Guys, I think UL ought to do a study and I've talked to Glenn Corbett about this. Maybe we could do it with pallets. So whatever it's, it's equal. I don't think that running out of water in your booster tank is the end of the world. And it certainly is not as bad as burning a building down. I worked for a chief that would not allow any more than one inch and a half line, even though we had a 3000 gallon tanker. So we would burn a building down, but we could take comfort in knowing we still had water in the booster tank. We're not fighting a class B fire that is going to roar back in. As Daryl said, it's not the fire you had when you got there. It's not going to roar back to its original intensity if it's a class, generally a class A fire. So uh, I think that's a point well taken, Daryl, is that a lot of times you, you, you got a thousand gallon booster tank out in the rural areas. You can take 10 minutes and use a hundred gallons a minute for 10 minutes, or you can use four minutes, 250 gallons a minute, put the fire out, or to at least knock it down to where it'll buy you some time to reestablish your water supply. So you guys, anyone go camping, right? When you're done camping, you want to put your fire out. Everyone carries, when you go camping, you got a five gallon bucket, right? You fill that five gallon bucket with water. Now, when you go to extinguish your campfire, because you don't want to leave embers burning, obviously, do you drill a little dime sized hole in the bottom of the bucket and you hold it over the campfire? for yeah. five minutes or you do you hit it with five gallons in about two seconds right 
Yeah, uh, Clark, you'd be surprised how many of our companies started carrying the five gallon Homer bucket on their rigs again so they could walk into the homeless encampments and put out these nuisance fires rather than stretching some line all the way there or using the can and having to go through that trouble of filling it back up yeah. and airing it up. So we were just throwing buckets up there. That's, a, that's another good topic for the future, Daryl. Seriously, that's another good topic because those five things- Five gallon are, bucket fires? Well, no, that, that, well, the homeless encampment issue. And, and if you look at the fires in places like India and, and places like that, where those things really start to grow over time, and the ones in America are growing that way, people start to build some very innovative and creative mm -hmm. places and getting in and out of them is not easy. And, and God, there's a body park. During the Occupy Wall Street. Very interesting. They had running generators in there. They had uh, full, uh, you know, they had all of the stuff in there. Uh, unbelievable. And um, not a good thing. You don't want to be going in there. You don't want to be bringing your line in there. You don't want to be cleaning your line when it comes out of there. We, Peter just ran some photos of uh, Fravales in Brazil. I believe they're still up on the site um, and, and it's, it's spelled F-A-V-E-L-A-S where they had, it, the folks there just live on top of each other. There, there are no, you know, there are no roads, alleyways. And, and that's what happens with the, a lack of code and code enforcement. And in, in many of those places mm -hmm. that Daryl's talking about, there's no rhyme or reason. Yeah, our really, we have a really large one out in, you know, West Oakland. And now, uh, you know, because there's a lot of mental illness and, you know, people on drugs and stuff like that. There's many reasons people are in these situations, but it, it uh, the engine companies cannot now enter that encampment without a police escort because you're, I mean, getting there, you, you have no address of where you are. It's, it literally looks like Mad Max Thunderdome type of area. You have to drive in blocks and blocks of nothing but homeless encampment and um you you don't know where you are or who's around you but you're you're kind of on your own back there so now we always have the police for any medical or or fire related call i think that uh, when we discuss the can in one of our future um uh Hangouts, my Captain Mike and I usually collaborate on this in between hangouts, and uh, let's uh, let's uh, have a representative from the Chicago Fire Department there, and we will discuss the merits of the five-gallon hand pump, and um, which I'm from the Chicago area, and that's what we use rather than the can, and uh, yeah, it's heavier. But however, I've seen guys dump some water out because. Uh, as they started to go up the stairs, they started to crap out. So dump a little, you have to lose a little ballast water there, I guess. But we used um, to call that, Bill, we used to call that a ghetto can. Two and a half gallon. One? A ghetto can is a two and a half gallon extinguisher with only two gallons of water in it, a lot more air. <laughs> the, forestry, the forestry unit that you're talking about, Bill, has five gallons you carry it on your back. And we used to call it an Indian water pump. Yeah, yeah, the Indian pump. And and it has a it had a nozzle that you could. You actually pumped. And yes, it would, it would get you a stream, and yeah, we we carried them all the time. Yeah, and I think we'll 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 bring one of those on, and uh, maybe we could do something outside. We could do it here, uh, uh, here at the training center or something. Maybe uh, you know a lot, uh, you know, like an on scene type of thing. Hey, I want to thank our friends at Key again uh, for their support. And uh, what a great company and good people. And Just in case they, we need it, Bill. All, all right. All right, Captain Mike. All right. And to your point, Captain Mike, I'm going to find out how they manage that, that fire department that I was talking about, how they manage to operate uh, the pump and uh, the ladder, operate that booster line. Let me find out. I'm okay. going to find out. It's, I have no experience with that, none whatsoever. So that was something that I was uh, discussing with uh, a friend of mine. So that, that was an interesting point. Uh, the other thing I think we really need to delve into the, uh, the cyanide poisoning and, uh, and how quickly 
you can be responding to a, a fire as a firefighter, all dressed up in, in the mindset you're going to put water on the red stuff and you're going to end up completely being involved with EMS, not one bit of fire you're going to see and how quickly that can happen and how we've got to be prepared for that at any fire. Uh, any closing thoughts here, uh, Chief Bobby? Well, two th- I remember, Daryl, when you brought that up the sodium uh, alternative, which is, a, which is a great product also. Back in the day, we had the amyl nitrate. I don't know if you remember that, but that was contraindicated in the presence of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So that, that became problematic. Um, so, but great point. Yeah, I would love to bring on some folks to talk more about that. I, w- I just want to say thank you to everybody on Facebook for chiming in. That's some great conversation on the Facebook page. And, and thank you, Pete, our producer, for uh, getting those great comments in there and all, all of you out there. We sure do appreciate you uh, joining up with us. Also, um, if you want to visit Key, they do have a booth at FDIC and uh, they would love to have you come by. And, and if you do go by the key booth, please tell them thank you for bringing uh, Captain Gustin and, and Captain Dugan to you uh, once a month with these incredible group of men and women and th- this great conversation. So please, while you're doing your, your dance card for FDIC, make sure that's on there. A lot of great things happen at FDIC. The Firefighter Cancer Support Network, as we talk about the cancer deal, we'll be having a fun run this year. They'll be taking over the fun run, the 5K on Thursday. So if you're an advocate for firefighter health and wellness and, and firefighter and want to support the network, please come out and run with us Thursday night. The fun, the stair climb is still on, all the other great events, the union party, the, the fool's bash, it's all still happening. A lot of great new classes. Please sign up early. The hot classes do sell out, uh, writ under fire, drilling at the speed of flashover. Uh, all of those classes uh, do sell out rather quickly. Got a couple of really great new classes. We've got a water rescue class from Mike Hudson which is going to be really amazing. Bobby Eckert is going to be doing a firefighting with limited staffing, and he always does a great job of instruction. So please uh, register early and, and uh, so you don't get shut out of these incredible classes. Uh, we're anticipating a huge crowd, um, you know, as, as we uh, turn the corner on this uh, 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 incredible worldwide event that seems to be uh, finally kind of uh, consuming itself maybe with this Omicron variant providing herd immunity across the world. So God willing, that that's where this ends up. And, and uh, obviously our sympathies and prayers are with all those who are ill currently with the Omicron uh, variant or the Delta variant or any, any measure of the, the COVID and anybody else in the fire service. Please keep Harry Carter in your prayers. Uh, Harry is a longtime friend of ours and he's very, very ill. And uh, he's always been an incredible a gentleman and and friend of all. So please please keep please keep him in your thoughts and prayers uh, at, at this very um, sad time in his life for for he and his family as they go through this uh, through this this uh, stage. So to, to all of you out there, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much to Clark, who's actually ill himself but managed to show up. That's a real trooper. Um, thank you for that, Daryl and Mike and and Bill. I think the world of all of you. Thank you for doing this, and thank you all for supporting us. God bless America. See you next month.